So a couple weeks ago I reviewed a DC animated movie, feel free to check that out, and I was thinking I should give Disney a shot. And while I'm at it, I might as well start at the very beginning. Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. That's right, it's dwarfs, not dwarves. Look at the poster. Disney says it's dwarfs, and who are we to argue with them? So Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs came out in 1937 and was the first feature-length animated movie. Now this was a big deal, because up until this point, cartoons had become more and more popular, and although characters like Popeye, Donald Duck, Mickey Mouse, and the Looney Tunes were everywhere, nobody really thought that an audience could sit through an hour, hour and a half long cartoon. And the concerns range from audiences being worried that the jokes would just feel repetitive, that they couldn't come up with enough new material to fill that runtime, to more ridiculous concerns of people thinking that it would hurt their eyes to stare at a cartoon for that long. Oh, 1937, you had a lot to learn. But regardless, this was a serious gamble on the part of Walt Disney. Snow White was incredibly expensive to animate. Again, this was back in the day when every frame of animation was drawn by hand, and it was a serious task to just put out that many drawings in a short amount of time. But Walt Disney knew that in order for Snow White to work, it had to accomplish three things. Number one, it had to suck you into the world. It had to actually get you to feel like you were in this world of fantasy. And number two, it had to make you care about Snow White. It had to convince you that at certain points, Snow White was actually in danger, even though she's only a cartoon. And number three, it had to make you laugh. It had to be funny. There had to be good jokes that wouldn't get stale. And watching Snow White again, it is a miracle how well this movie holds up. It not only accomplished all three things, but it is an impressive feat of animation. It is light years ahead of everything else that was happening at this time. And that's because Disney knew he had to put his best foot forward in this project, and he didn't just throw his animators to the wolves to animate this thing. There were two very important shorts that Disney put out to kind of test the techniques that they were working on for Snow White. The first of which being the Goddess of Spring. Now, if you haven't seen The Goddess of Spring, it is a weird story. It's not great, but it is thoroughly entertaining in just seeing how far animation has come. Because The Goddess of Spring was their first attempt to try to get away from the rubber hose or squash and stretch animation that was really popular at the time, but admittedly not all that realistic. And if you want to animate people, you know, human beings, they need to move like human beings. They need to move like they have bones. And Goddess of Spring tries it a couple times, but I mean, there are some moments where she, she's got noodle arms. But in all fairness, that was their first attempt, and for a first attempt, it's not horrible. She moves realistic enough sometimes. But now compare that to just a couple years later when they did Snow White and oh my gosh, that's night and day. Snow White moves so much more realistic and not just her, but everybody, the prince, the evil queen, they all have such rigid motions that feel like they have bones. And that serves to make us care about these characters because if they move like a human, well then they can get hurt just like any other human. And that creates the much needed dramatic tension to drive this plot forward. But the second really important short that they used to test Snow White was The Old Mill. Now this is also on Disney+. Plus. Highly recommend watching it. It won the Academy Award for Best Animated Short of that year and it has very cool. There's practically no story, but what it does is it takes you into an old mill that's abandoned and it shows all the animals that live there, all the different levels in the mill, and they accomplish this by the multi-plane camera. Look at that beauty. This is the single most important innovation for the art of animation before computers were invented. But what this machine does is it uses multiple levels of glass planes that the animators will paint the backgrounds on and then use a camera to shoot through so it creates a sense of depth. And each plane can be moved separately to give it a sense of depth or give it a sense of panning because the way the eye works, stuff closer to you moves faster than stuff farther away. So if you can move multiple planes separately, you can create that illusion of depth. And in the old mill, they use it to remarkable effect. Unlike the Goddess of Spring where they still had to work out the kinks, the old mill mastered this right away. And again, they use these same techniques in Snow White. Whenever we see a look at the castle, it's not just a static shot, they're moving in. They're moving the foreground and the background separately to give us the illusion of depth that there's a camera in this forest and we're moving towards the castle. 
it's a really effective technique that honestly gets overlooked when people talk about these old cartoons because these cartoons wouldn't be nearly as immersive if it weren't for this invention. So just to recap, the Gauss of Spring came out to test more realistic movements to make us care about the character of Snow White, and the Old Mill came out to test the multiplane camera to get us more invested into the world of the cartoon. But how did they manage to keep us laughing for an hour and a half? Well, that's where the dwarves come in, and the single greatest stroke of genius that Disney had in crafting this story, you know, aside from all of his other genius moments, was the decision to give each dwarf their distinct personality. Because honestly, it's the personality of the dwarves and how they bounce off of each other that makes us laugh. It's not necessarily the gags, although they are pretty funny. But what really gets us invested is the fact that Doc and Grumpy don't get along, that Dopey is always picked on and belittled by the other dwarves, and so on and so on. But let's dive into the story. Now, do I even need to sum up the story of Snow White? I mean, you all know it. This story is like woven into the DNA of America, so I'm gonna go through it pretty quick. We've got an evil queen with a magic mirror. She's jealous of her stepdaughter, Snow White, so she has her killed, but the huntsman can't kill her, so she flees into the woods, meets seven dwarfs, they keep her safe. The evil queen comes a knocking while she's home alone. She bites the apple, passes out. Everyone thinks she's dead. The prince comes on by, kisses her. She wakes up and they all live happily ever after. Yeah, you know this story. But even though we all know this story, it's a classic fairy tale setup. It doesn't really do anything out of the ordinary. There's a setup, there's a payoff, there's some jokes in the middle. It is pretty cool to see how many Disney tropes that we take for granted nowadays began with Snow White. True love's kiss breaking the spell, beginning and ending the movie with a realistic book, the evil stepmother, and the princess's bizarre power to talk to woodland creatures like she's Aquaman or something. So yeah, if you're curious to see where all these tropes come back to, it is Snow White. Snow White was the template for everything Disney did later, and is still doing today apparently. And speaking of things Disney's still doing today, let's talk about the songs, because this is a musical. And oh, there are some songs. Now there are actually more songs in Snow White than I remember. And if I were to bet, I'd say that you couldn't name all the songs in Snow White. You might get Whistle While You Work or Hi Ho or One Day My Prince Will Come, even though a surprising amount of people think that that is from Sleeping Beauty, but no, it's, it's Snow White. But do you remember the Dwarves' Wash song or the Prince's One song, which ironically is the one song that he gets in this movie? Or how about the silly song with the dwarves yodeling? Yeah, now that I mention them, they're all coming back because these songs are just ingrained into our DNA at this point. It's really kind of scary. Like, we're all brainwashed. I mean, I was definitely brainwashed as a kid. I mean, I grew up with the Disney VHS tapes. I mean, that was a large part of my childhood. But I have a feeling there's a lot of you out there that were also heavily influenced by Disney as a kid. And in some part of your deep subconscious, all these songs are there just waiting to be brought back. And for that, you're welcome. But here's what I really wanted to talk about in regards to Snow White. It's not the songs as great as they are. It's not the history behind it, even though it's fascinating. It's just how good the animation is. Guys, this came out in 1937. I couldn't find anything that came out in 1937 that looked that good. And even into the 40s, things didn't look this good. Just look at the Max Fleischer Superman. Now, let's be clear, I love the Max Fleischer Superman cartoons. They are fantastic. The tone, the action, the fact that they somehow cracked the code to animate guys realistically where Disney still took many more years to perfect that. Those Superman cartoons are fantastic, but the quality of animation is not the same as Snow White. It is mind-blowing how good Snow White looks. It's the attention to detail. From the backgrounds for the dwarves' cottage, you know, all the little wood carvings and etchings that they had to draw, to the dungeon of the evil queen, you know, the shading of every stone, and probably the most impressive shot, which is during the silly song, song, where Grumpy is playing the organ and each valve on the organ has a little flap that opens and closes. And there's like 20 or so flaps in just one shot that all need to be animated individually and timed to the music. I honestly don't know how they did it. These are just some incredibly talented artists. They're great storytellers. They know exactly what they're doing, even though nobody did it before. So yeah, I had to get that off my chest. The animation quality in Snow White is bonkers. If you haven't seen it in a while, go check it out. Please, it's free. If you're a fan of animation or just curious to see how did it work before computers got involved, 
Snow White is the movie to watch. It is a masterclass in animation. I cannot recommend this movie enough, guys. But it wouldn't be a complete review of a Golden Age Disney movie without talking about the dark stuff. It's really funny looking back at these older Disney movies, how mature they were compared to what, you know, Disney's putting out now. Because they took risks. They weren't afraid to get a little spooky or scary or sad or just intense. And Snow White is no exception to that. In fact, I think Snow White balances the light and dark elements better than really any other Disney movie I can think of. Because even though this movie does shift tone from very dark and sinister to, you know, happy-go-lucky and fun, it doesn't feel like a shift. There's always a consistent atmosphere. Because even though the dwarves are clearly the comic relief and they're happy and jumping and clapping all the time, the dwarves' cottage is still kind of spooky looking. There's a lot of harsh shadows and some of those wood carvings are a little off. But this movie starts right out of the gate with some fairly intense imagery. You see the magic mirror, which I love the design of the magic mirror. No other magic mirror design has been so cool yet so creepy at the same time. It's almost hypnotizing with all the different colors and shadows that happen on its face. It's really effective. But then you get into the stuff with the evil queen and she's sending the huntsman to rip out her heart and put it in a little box for her. I mean, say what you want about Once Upon a Time and I'm not the biggest fan, but they took full advantage of that concept in a way that 1937 definitely was not ready for. But even though you don't actually see it in the movie, that is still a pretty intense idea for a little kid. But after that, the movie kind of calms down. There's nothing too scary or intense. I mean, the look and transformation of the witch is an impressive feat of animation. How they were able to move the different planes in opposite directions to give that spinning effect. And while the look of the witch isn't pleasant, it's not too scary, or at least it never really scared me as a kid. But there is one scene that made me not scared and not really sad, but just kind of uneasy like the atmosphere really got to me and that's the funeral scene after snow white bites the apple the dwarves find her and they have a a wake for lack of a better term in the cottage and it is beautifully animated like everything else but the, all the dwarves are crying it's very somber there's this slow organ music playing it's so atmospheric that even the candles are crying that's some next level animation for 1937. And again, while it didn't make me cry, it did make me feel sad for these dwarves that I liked watching all the time. But it is a really effective, somber scene that not many modern Disney movies feel comfortable showing. But my theory is that the reason these classics have endured for so long is because of these slower, more reflective scenes. You look at Snow White, you look at Bambi, you look at even The Lion King. They had a lot of fun, upbeat scenes and some catchy songs, but it's in the slower moments where the animation really shines and it gives kids time to process what they're watching, especially in such a fast-paced medium as animation. And that about wraps up my thoughts on Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, the first in a long line of Disney theatrical movies. And even though it was made over 80 years ago, it's still holds up surprisingly well. But now I turn it over to you guys. What are your thoughts about Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs? Did you watch it when you were a kid and never watch it again? Did you watch it a few years ago or did you just watch it yesterday? The greatest thing that Disney Plus has brought us, you know, aside from The Mandalorian, is the opportunity to revisit some of these Disney classics. So if you haven't seen it in a while, I highly recommend you give it another watch. And if you like this video, be sure to give it a like and subscribe for more content and hit the notification bell to be notified every time I upload a video. And as always, I'm Colby. This is my nerdy talk. And I'll see you in the next video.